Today we begin a new series, The Psychology of Jesus Living the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes of Christ are the opening of the great Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew's Gospel, chapters 5, 6, and 7. The Beatitudes show us the way of salvation. They show us the way of a happy and healthy life. Today we begin with the first Beatitude as we talk about true riches. Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blaise Pascal, the French mathematician, theologian, inventor, and author, said all people seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all work toward this end. This is the motive of every action of every person. It's fascinating that Jesus began his public teaching ministry talking about happiness. Happiness is the first theme of the Sermon on the Mount. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 1, that when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he continued to give them eight blessings, eight beatitudes. The word blessed means to be happy, to be fortunate, to be privileged. It is the Greek word makarios that is used 50 different times in the New Testament. It describes a joy that is self-contained, a joy that is independent of anything happening in life. The ancient Greeks called the island of Cyprus out in the Mediterranean the Makarios Isle. They believed that it was the happy island, the way that many people look at Hawaii today or a place like that, an exotic island, because the Greeks believed that they could just go to Cyprus and live there. It had everything they needed to be happy. But Jesus teaches us that happiness is far greater than the surroundings, the island or the place where we live, the place where we work, the people in our lives, that happiness is inward. It's interesting that Paul the Apostle uses the same word makarios to describe the nature of God. He calls him the blessed or happy God in 1 Timothy 1 verse 11, that we have the ability to be happy because we're made in God's image. And God himself is a God of joy, a God of happiness. And he desires for us to live a happy life. And so many times we are so frustrated, we're so stressed out. There's a lot of unhappy things that happen in our lives. And yet Jesus promises us that there's a deeper place spiritually where we can find an inward joy, a perpetual joy, a true happiness, satisfaction, and contentment, a place of blessing in life. Now, the Beatitudes themselves, these eight Beatitudes, give us a description of eight stages of spiritual growth. As Christians, as we grow in our faith, it is as though we are growing through the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. We start with being poor in spirit, which we're going to talk about today. That sense of humility and dependency on God. And we grow to the place that even if we're persecuted, we're faithful to Jesus because our roots of faith are so deep. Now, the Beatitudes start with this first important, all-important truth. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, each of these Beatitudes give us a principle and a promise. So the principle for life, the living principle, is to be poor in spirit. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? He's describing that we are spiritually poor without Christ in our lives, without the grace of God. Poor in spirit means first and foremost, recognizing our spiritual bankruptcy because of sin. The Bible teaches clearly that all of us are born in sin. There's a sinful nature to humanity, just as there is a goodness to humanity because we're made in God's image. And yet the Bible is clear that Each person born has a sin problem and a separation from God. The Bible tells us in Romans 3, verse 23 and 24, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by the grace that came through the redemption of Christ Jesus. 
All have sinned. All of us have fallen short of God's glory, God's standard. And all of us can be justified. That means made right, righteous, returned to a right relationship with God through the grace that came through the redeeming work of Jesus on the cross. But poor in spirit means that we recognize we are spiritually bankrupt. This word describes a person who's totally bankrupt, completely out of money, with no means to pay their debts. And the greatest debt is the debt of sin, our transgressions, our sinfulness by nature, but we've all committed sins by choice. We've all gone our own way. We've rebelled against God. We've all disobeyed God in word and thought and deed and negligence. And sometimes people, because of spiritual pride, fail to realize their need of grace. And the entrance into the kingdom of heaven is realizing you're poor in spirit. I think that's what happened to the thief on the cross when he died next to Jesus in the last hours of his life. He finally realized that he was in need of saving grace. And he cried out to Christ, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He realized in that moment he wasn't ready for eternity. He was spiritually bankrupt. People can have all types of wealth financial wealth, property, assets. But he's not talking about financial poverty. Jesus says you've got to recognize no matter how rich you may be on the outside, every person is spiritually bankrupt and they need the grace of God. You see, when we're born again, God credits the righteousness of Christ to our account. That's what the word justification means. We're justified by faith, Romans 5 and 1. It's the great truth of Scripture. The word actually means to credit to someone's account the righteousness of Christ. The same way that if somebody went into your bank today and deposited a million dollars in your checking account and you found out it was a legitimate gift to you because somebody cared about you, think about how joyful you'd be, how happy you'd be. Well, that's what it means when you receive Christ, the riches of Christ. His righteousness has been accredited to the spiritual bankruptcy of our hearts. But he says, you've got to recognize you're bankrupt. You can't be like many of the Pharisees were, and many religious people are there. They think their works are going to save them, and their morality is going to save them, and their good works are going to save them. And sometimes they say, well, I'm better than other people, that that's going to save them. They don't realize that they too are spiritually bankrupt. And he says, that's when you enter the kingdom of God, when you admit your need of grace. You say, I'm a sinner in need of salvation. Poor in spirit also means that we rely totally on God's grace to save us and to keep us. We realize we can't work our way to heaven. We can't earn our way to heaven. You can't, if you think of sin as a debt against God, you can't pay that debt off. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. None of us can boast that we've provided atonement for our sins. We can't boast that we've earned our way to heaven. And so poor in spirit is an ongoing attitude in our lives. Even though we come into the kingdom of God knowing that we are sinners in need of grace, we always remember that. Now, without Christ, we are spiritually bankrupt. This is why we don't turn to works after grace, as though we're trying to make ourselves more saved. Many people are like that. They, they think if they pray more or they do more to help others, or they do religious works that somehow they're more guaranteed of heaven. But you are saved by grace and kept by grace. And that is that poverty of spirit mentality to realize that the only true spiritual wealth is the wealth of Christ's righteousness in our hearts. We do pray not to become righteous, but because he's made us righteous. We do help others not to earn our way to heaven because we're going to heaven and we want to help others get there as well. Poor in spirit is an attitude of spiritual maturity. It's, it's not an attitude that we leave behind the more that we grow spiritually. Poor in spirit is, a, is another way of describing humility. That sense of total dependency and gratitude to God for his blessings and grace on our lives. And this is why we read about the virtue and the value of humility all the way through the Scripture. Jesus talked about it in Mark chapter 10, verse 43 through 45 in a passage that he encouraged his disciples to keep that poor in spirit attitude. When he said, the Gentiles lord their authority over others, but not so with you. Whoever be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven must become the servant of all. 
For even the Son of Man, he said, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He talked about being poor in spirit in Luke 18, verse 14, when he said, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Peter talked about it in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 and 6, and he was here that, that day that Jesus first taught those Beatitudes. He heard Christ himself describe being poor in spirit, humility before God to receive the grace of God. And he writes about it in his own writings when he says, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. He says, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Now, this principle of being poor in spirit, of recognizing our sinfulness, recognizing our need of grace, of living with gratitude and the grace of God, of living with a sense of humility and dependency upon God, it also has a promise. He says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, that suddenly we who were poor in spirit are now rich with the riches of Christ, with spiritual riches. We're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We were poor in spirit, but now we're in the kingdom of heaven. Well, the kingdom of heaven is a present and future promise. Jesus talked about the kingdom being here and now in Luke chapter 17, verse 20 and 21. He said the kingdom doesn't come with observation. People will say here it is or there it is. For the kingdom is within you. It's the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's the new birth. It's the fact that Christ lives in your heart by faith. In Romans 14 and 17, Paul described the kingdom of God as a spiritual reality in us and that we are in it. We live in the kingdom is one of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven being a a place in heaven for the eternal soul of humanity. In John 14, verse 1 through 3, he said, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house were many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. So, In this world, when Christ is Lord of our hearts, we live in the kingdom. We live in the blessings of the kingdom. Christ the King lives in our hearts. We're in a close relationship with Him is what that means. And we're guaranteed the fact that when this life is over, He said, I prepared a place for you in heaven. The kingdom of heaven also refers to the spiritual riches that belong to us now. You are rich in Christ. Ephesians 3 verse 8 describes the unsearchable riches of Christ. Think of how rich you really are as a Christian. You're rich in grace, rich in forgiveness, rich in love, rich with the righteousness of Christ, rich with the promise of answered prayer. Think of all the riches that are truly yours, who were once poor in spirit, but now Christ has saved us from our sins and has given us spiritual riches. And financial riches are great. They make life wonderful and easy, but they pass with time. But spiritual riches endure. In Romans chapter 8, verse 14 through 17, the Bible says that we're now the sons and daughters of God, heirs of God, and co-heirs with Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1, verse 3 says that God has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. And today, in Christ, you are blessed with every spiritual blessing. So regardless of how successful we become, how financially well-to-do we all get in life. Let's remember our true riches. Let's remember that we are poor in spirit without the grace of God, that only Christ can save us, and that we are rich today in forgiveness in the love of God, rich with the promises of God. Truly, we who are once poor in spirit have now in Christ inherited the kingdom of heaven. Join me for prayer. Lord, thank you today for your word, and I pray that every person who hears this teaching today will come to know you through faith in Christ if they've not made that commitment. I thank you, Lord, that we who have found Christ as Savior today, truly, we are blessed beyond words, and we give you praise and blessing and honor. And Lord, give us the grace to always live with a humble spirit dependent upon you for everything and recognizing we are what we are because of your wonderful grace. Bless every person, minister to them today, meet their needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus, I pray in his holy name. Thank you for sharing this time with them. Looking forward to this new study on the psychology of Jesus. Encourage you to make sure that you watch every week and every teaching that is in it and encourage others to do so as well. It's a great ministry you can have to invite others to share in the Dig Deep Bible study with us. 
Thank you for your gracious and faithful commitment to Mount Perrin. I want to thank you for your financial support of the church. And if you've not started supporting the ministry, I would encourage you to do so. You can go online and there's amazing ministries that you can support in your tithes and offerings. If you're part of the Mount Perrin family, wherever you are in the world, your financial support is needed and it's greatly appreciated and helps us reach so many for Christ every day somewhere around the world. Sunday's coming. I'm looking forward to seeing you and your family in church for worship. Invite somebody to be with you. God bless you. I'll see you Sunday for worship. Have a great day.